Deutsche Welle Global Media Forum, the international congress that provides a platform for more than 2,000 media representatives and experts from the fields of politics, culture, business, development, and science. Welcome to Bonn, the UN city of Germany. These delegates design interdisciplinary approaches to meeting the challenges of global problems and explore how the media can play a central role in investigating and communicating solutions. The real natural resource of our time is no longer under our feet, but between our ears. The three-day conference program contains more than 50 panel discussions, workshops, interactive presentations, and exhibitions, as well as attractive leisure events in and around the World Conference Center in Bonn, Germany. It is great for me to be back uh, in Bonn. So that means half of the human beings in this world spend their lives on less than $10 a week. I read the newspaper because every day I want to find out how they want to trick me this day. You feel the mission. Launch a one-year campaign, you get very, very useful information. Highlight uh, what is actually happening in this world. Between uh, journalist, advocacy and diplomacy. To actually push the issue rather than try and push themselves. The challenge is uh, the question of democracy and elections. Keep that alive and build a more stable and more transparent and accountable democracy. So next time you must join us. Thank you. Each year, the conference is focused on a different issue related to media and development. In 2008, the conference theme was media and peace building and conflict prevention. In 2009, conflict prevention in the multimedia age. The topic in 2010, the heat is on, climate change and the media. 2011, human rights in a globalized world challenges for the media and in 2012 culture education media shaping a sustainable world for the participants from more than 100 nations the forum offers excellent opportunities for conversation and exchange as a result an international network has developed and is still growing the future of growth economic values and the media will be the topic of the upcoming conference in 2013. How can the media explore and communicate systematic approaches toward a sustainable global economy? Engage in our international network, be part of the solution to global issues, and become a member of the Deutsche Welle Global Media Forum family. Wonderful good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Congratulations uh, to all of you who actually got out of bed and uh, have uh, managed to attend here that early. And uh, I hope that you did actually have a really, really nice evening uh, last night, did a lot of that networking that we talked about. In order to um, get into Amrita's panel, and uh, the fabulous panel is already sitting here, I'm going to start off with a little bit of a damper. Um, because apart from the fact that we're all journalists uh, or working with the media, I'm very sure that we all have a device like this, at least similar to it, uh, maybe smaller, maybe bigger, but all of us probably have a mobile phone. Now, we have one problem in that, because we're all guilty. We're probably guilty in participating in slave labor that is being used to take out the coltan that is necessary for all mobile phones to work in Congo's mines, or even if it's not slave labor, then it's probably labor in very bad working conditions. Now, I know that. On the other hand, yes, I do need my mobile phone. I have a dilemma. I would love companies that sell me that mobile phone to give me a guarantee that the production of Coltan that is in my mobile has been done under humane circumstances. The people who actually were working for me, for us, were able to live off the wage that they would have gotten, that they could send their kids to school. At the moment, 
wishful thinking. There might be paths to achieve that. How and why? Amrita Chima will discuss that, the corporate social responsibility, with her absolutely fabulous panel. And Amrita is a very valued colleague from Deutsche Welle TV, already doing lots of conf uh, conferences on issues like that. So, Amrita, now please take it away. And ladies and gentlemen, breathe through. We're all in the same position. And maybe in the next hour and a half, we'll find an answer to that. Hello, everyone. A very, very warm welcome to you. I do realize that uh, on a third day of a conference, a certain amount of fatigue sets in. So it is difficult to be here on time. So I really thank you for being here punctually. And I want all of you to give yourselves a big hand for being punctual on this final day and the final plenary of the Global Media Forum. So clap. <laughs> this is for yourselves. <laughs> Now, we are here to discuss um, the nature of growth. The, this is the third and final plenary of the Global Media Forum this year. Over the last few days, I've attended many workshops, conferences, listened to speeches about the future of growth. And one thing seems to be clear. There's a fairly unanimous consensus that the, we have to shift our focus from mere growth to the quality of this growth that it simply cannot be business as usual. We have to look at new models, which will work not just for profit, but make growth more exclusive, more sustainable, more responsible, and more long-term. Now, as Connie said, we have a fabulous panel for you, and I'm therefore a bit sad that we started a bit late, because we have lots of contributions to make on this very important topic. But let me just tell you a few other things that we need to, you need to know. Now, panelists will come, but before that, I'd like to tell you that I want you to be a part of the conversation. And there are two ways you can do that. We'll be carrying a um, Twitter feed. You can actually send your comments and queries via Twitter. Yana will stand up here. Yana is going to be taking your comments in. And at periodic times, she'll be telling us what you're saying, what questions you're asking. Secondly, at the end of the panel discussion, we'll have about 15 minutes for questions. So listen to the debate carefully, listen to the discussion carefully. And if there are issues you feel we haven't raised, or you would like clarification, or you would like to make a contribution, that'll be the time you can do that. I'll also like to draw your attention to another colleague, that is Karina Antons standing there, and she is going to be doing a visual graphic representation of this plenary. So she'll be listening to what we are saying, she'll be listening, hearing what comments are saying, and she's going to do a graphic representation, which will then be put in the main uh, atrium for you to have a look in case you've missed certain points. It'll give you an idea as to what the debate actually resulted in. Thank you very much for that, uh, Karina. Um, we are going to start this session actually with a keynote address. May I invite Mr. Dirk Schatzschneider, Director General from the Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development, BMZ, Germany. He's making the keynote address on the topic of our plenary, which is changing economic values, green economy, corporate social responsibility, and human rights. Dr. Dirk Schneider, give him a big hand, ladies and gentlemen. Well, thank you, Amrita, for your friendly words and introduction. Um, I'm really glad um, to be here in my old home and university town in front of such an outstanding audience. Um, and uh, a special thanks to Deutsche Welle and all co-organizers and sponsors of uh, this um, excellent event and conference. Uh, congratulations from my part. Um, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, um, it is obviously a great pleasure for me as a development policy maker to be here at the Deutsche Welle Global Media Forum. One vital precondition for sustainable development and good governance are free media. We can see in our day-to-day policymaking work the great problems in countries that restrict the freedom of the press. One can describe the link between development and freedom of the press in just a few words. No progress without freedom. That is why we as BMZ give targeted support to the press and media in our development cooperation. And therefore, we are supporting Deutsche Welle Akademie this year with 9.4 million euro. 
Deutsche Welle Akademie is a leader in the field of media development in developing countries. Ladies and gentlemen, changing economic values, green economy, corporate social responsibility, and human rights are issues that are very important for our work in the German Development Ministry. The global population is growing constantly, as we all know. In the last 12 years, it has grown by one billion people. If we want to meet the most basic needs of all these people, we need much more of everything. More safe drinking water, more energy, more food. But we do not want to, and in fact, we must not, generate these necessary resources at the expense of the environment. A modern economy must therefore take into account the fact that ecosystems cannot regenerate forever. They will be exhausted at some point. So we do need economies that do not grow at the expense of the environment, but together with it. This requires political energy, wise strategies, and intelligent technologies. But it also requires more courage on the part of business people and more investment. Private enterprises are vital players in globalization. They can make a big difference when it comes to making globalization sustainable. We want to work with the private sector and civil society to enhance people's opportunities. We want to build the future together. We want to find innovative answers to all global challenges. Dear colleagues, it's an ethical imperative for us to fight poverty and hunger and to meet the challenges of scarce resources, environmental protection, and climate change. And it is in our own interest to achieve sustainable econo economic development so as to build a future for the generations to come after us. To that end, we need to get rid of a misconception. The misconception that more altruistic development policy equals better development policy. Government equals altruistic equals good is neither an equation nor an inequality. It is simply nonsense. Just like the assumption that the private sector is always bad and evil. One thing is obvious. There can be no sustainable development without sustainable economic development. So we support companies that take their responsibilities seriously and are interested in more than quick profits at all costs. And our introduction by Conny Simoch uh, mentioned what could be uh, a very important and right example for what I mentioned at this point. In developing countries, German companies have a rep reputation for often using higher social and environmental standards than what is required locally. So people on the ground benefit from German investment through more and better jobs, through training and technology transfer, and through demand for goods and services from local suppliers. And of course, as a German government, we also want the German companies to benefit from investing in developing and emerging economies. Only then, they will stay involved on a sustainable basis. Moreover, it is an enterprise's own strategic interest to voluntarily make sustainability the guiding principle of their work. Corporate social responsibility combines general social concerns with long-term benefits for the enterprise. I'm thinking here of an intact environment, safe water, and reliable energy supply. These things are absolutely vital for almost all economic activities. I'm thinking of access to new markets. They can be tapped if one takes even the poorest people seriously as potential business partners. And I'm thinking very pragmatically of the improved reputation that companies can build through social and environmental responsibility. Again, the example of the Coltan, for example. Companies need to comply with their human rights responsibility all along their global supply chains. The tragedies recently in factories in Bangladesh 
are powerful evidence of that. So sustainable development policy and corporate social responsibility are natural allies in our attempts to create a decent future. This is how we define sustainable poverty reduction. This means that our development policy is based on our values and also on our proper interests. And we want to fight poverty and hunger in a way that is both active and activating. Ladies and gentlemen, the quotation, it is better to do nothing than to do the wrong thing, in my opinion, is totally wrong. We don't want a clean hand ethic that comes from doing nothing. Don't back away, do it, is therefore the first of five theses for a new ethical development cooperation. We want to make sure that our partners are able to take their economic, social and political development into their own hands as quickly as possible. People in developing countries are not recipients of handouts. They are, in fact, the key players in their own development. That is why the second thesis is partners, not patrons. Because of our focus on human dignity, we have made universal human rights our guiding principle. In order to live up to that principle, we have introduced a human rights check and an anti-corruption strategy at the BMZ. We assist our partners in their efforts to achieve sustainable development. And we challenge them to practice good governance and protect human rights, because that is the only way development can succeed. And therefore, the third thesis is assist and challenge. But governments cannot bring about development all by themselves. We can only do this together with the people. Effective development policy requires personal encounters and personal involvement. That is why thesis number four is people, not governments, matter. Of course, we do not intend these theses to be universally applicable or the final word. And that is also the fifth and last thesis for me this morning on ethics and development cooperation. And this says an open future needs an open society. We must remain open to change and to new and different ways of thinking. Otherwise, we will destroy ourselves and all our future opportunities. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, sustainable development is only possible if all stakeholders work together. Governments, the private sector, civil society, and also the media. The media can report about examples of excellent social and environmental performance, but they can also expose instances of serious misconduct. So they play a crucial part in the formation of public opinion. This means that the media, too, must live up to their responsibility. I hope that the ideas discussed today will remain on our minds beyond today. I hope they will inspire and motivate us to work for more sustainability, more corporate social responsibility, and more human rights. Only together we will be able to design more effective development policies that are fit for the future. Based on our motto for development cooperation from the German government's part, you are warmly invited to be our future makers. We are building the future. Let's join forces together. Let's build a better future together. Thank you for your attention. I wish you a fruitful discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Dirk Schattenschneider, for giving us a perspective from the German Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. They were inspiring words. He came up with five principles of more ethical forms of development cooperation and a strong plea that all of us have to make a concerted effort in changing economic values that all of us, by the government, the corporate sector, civil society, as well as all of us here journalists, 
who are among us many potential, what he called, future makers. May I now invite our panelists to come forward, and I'll introduce them as they come up. I don't know if you sit there. I think I've put names. I think I could be out there. And Now, as uh, Connie promised you, we have a fabulous panel here. I'm going to be introducing them in alphabetical order, starting with uh, Professor Ibrahim Abulish. He's the founder and chairman of Sikkim, based in Egypt. It's a social entrepreneurial uh, company. We'll hear more about that during our debate. Rainer Hengsman is the global director of Puma Safe Supply Chain. Then we have John Morrison, who's the executive director for the Institute for Human Rights and Business, based in England. Uh, Professor Klaus Töpfer, who is our surprise guest this morning, we're very happy to have you here. He is the executive director for the Institute for Advanced and Sustainable Studies in Potsdam. He's also very well known as the executive director of the United Nations Environmental Program, and we here in Germany know him as a former environment minister. And then we have Jakob von Uxköl. He is the founder of the World Future Council, as well as the Right Livelihood Award, which we all know as an alternative Nobel Prize. Thank you very much, and please give them a big hand. <laughs> Now, before I uh, put the first question, I want to remind you again that we'll be taking your comments on Twitter. Jana here will be monitoring what you're saying, any questions you might be asking, and during the panel discussion, if they're interesting stuff, then we'll uh, raise those issues. And also to remind those of you who've come in a bit late that we'll have a question and answer session at the end of the panel discussion, the last 15, 20 minutes. So listen carefully. And if I may mention the instrument Connie talked about, mobile phones, uh, I know a lot of you are addicted to them. I would suggest you turn them off and concentrate on what we are saying here, but if you can't do that, please put them on silent. We don't want to interrupt the discussion with kind of mobile phones going off. Thank you very much. Now, John, let me start with you. Now, you, as I mentioned, are the Executive Director of the Institute for Human Rights and Business. Mr. Schattenstein has stressed the need of all stakeholders to work together, and you're involved with many of these stakeholders. Many people feel business and human rights is an oxymoron. What has your experience been on human rights and business? Thank you very much, and uh, just, just some very brief thoughts. First of all, uh, five middle-aged men on a panel are not the solution. <laughs> We're part of the solution, maybe, but, uh, but uh, clearly uh, only a part. Um, first, first point, economic growth um, can no longer be seen as something independent from social impact. Second point... The creation of jobs by business is not a justification in itself. It's an important thing, but it's not the only thing that business needs to do. And in fact, with technology, for the first time in history, economic growth doesn't necessarily mean uh, answers to 50% youth unemployment, for example. So we need to rethink the relationship between business and society. Point number three, businesses can no longer externalize their social and environmental impacts. Adam Smith never said that. Milton Friedman might have said it, but we need better thinking going forward. Number four, social license to operate matters to both governments and businesses. As we see in Brazil, Turkey, North Africa, all over the world, Stockholm, London, etc. Um, governments, it's not enough for a government to win an election every four or five years. It's not enough for a business just to get a legal license to operate. It has to maintain social consent. Number five, for the first time in history, we have, at least in the UN, OECD and EU, agreed that businesses now have a direct responsibility to respect human rights. Um, and I would say that is more than a voluntary association. This is more than voluntary CSR. Um, human rights are not voluntary. Respecting human rights is not a voluntary concept. That doesn't mean that everything that a business does should be regulated or be hard law. But taking Connie's example of the mobile phone, we're discussing this in Europe at the moment, whether we should uh, in, in create mandatory transparency in supply chains to ensure that conflict minerals are not there. The US has passed that into law. 
let's not have that as a voluntary issue in Europe, for goodness sake. Um, you know. <laughs> How can that be a voluntary issue? And finally, my final word is Bangladesh. Again, um, many European companies source from Bangladesh. Why do we source from Bangladesh? Because it's cheap. Why is it cheap? Lots of reasons, but externalization of the true social cost um, of production means that buildings fall down and kill people. Uh, that is unsustainable and unethical. So however we respond to Bangladesh, it needs to be systemic. Governments, business, and civil society needs to work, need to work together, and philanthropy on its own will not answer the problem. Thank you. Thanks, John. Now, uh, Rana, as we heard, that um, um, John said that businesses should take more responsibility. Puma, the company where you work, has set up the Safe Supply Chain Initiative. Now, tell us more about this initiative. Why did your company set it up? What impact has it had on your company? Uh, thank you very much. Well, I have to start a little bit in the past. Um, when I started with my, with my uh, job uh, within Puma, there was a time that our procurement had basically no idea where the stuff is coming from. We know we were sourcing around the world, directly, indirectly, and first, of course, uh, first and foremost, of course, we wanted to know where are the products coming from, and then second, and this is actually which differentiates us as well from from our competitors, we are trying to go a different way. Um, we said, well, this is or these are our indirect employees, so there is a responsibility from our side. Uh, having said that, we started in 1993, slowly setting up standards. But you know, uh, we all know paper is patient. Um, we had to set up then an international team, which is really spread around the world. Uh, doing nothing else than now going into factories and checking standards we have set up. And as the keynote speaker mentioned this morning, yes, we did the same. Our standards are, are higher than the normal ones, especially than the national ones. Uh, simply showing again our responsibility, saying, well, basically we want to go the extra mile. And within our initiative, um, we just... Um, and this was mentioned by John as well, we just thought as well uh, whether it would make sense to internalize externalities because this is as well part of, our, part of our share. So in 2010, we came up with the first attempt of an, we, we called it environmental profit and loss anal uh, analysis, internalizing externalities, but not from our core business, basically our entire supply chain around the world. So while we came up with a huge amount of money, which probably we and our suppliers would have to pay if the nature would have a bank, uh, a bank account. Well, as of, as of now, we all know there is nothing like this. I mean, this is as well a call to the governments that, you know, based on this, uh, we, have to have, we have to come up with policies because we can only manage our business in a sustainable way if we measure. And <clears throat> one thing as well, what we figured, um, <clears throat> it's quite easy. A lot of, of organisations look at, let me call it the low-hanging fruits, the environment. Yeah. You know, it's easy to measure the litres of water you spend, the kilograms of waste you produce, but when it comes to the human being, basically behind our products, doing this stuff, example Bangladesh, uh, we, don't actually, uh, we basically don't have to go that far. But... Uh, after we come up, uh, I came up with this, with this environmental statement, we said, well, the equation is not complete. We have the environmental sector. Now we need the social sector to be promoted and look into this as well. So basically, this is just a few words, uh, what, we are, what, we are, what we did, what we are doing, what we intend to do through our initiatives, not only on the supply chain, actually going beyond. Right, so that's one example of a company, a corporate company, taking some responsibility for the implications of its activities, not just economically, but also socially. Klaus Töpfer, you have won the German Sustainability Award. You were inducted in the Kyoto Hall of Fame last year, and I mentioned you were the former Environment Minister. Public policy is extremely crucial in this area. How satisfied are you with the progress made by governments towards moving towards a more green economy since you were environment minister? You never can be satisfied. Then you are going already in a trap. 
but uh, we tried our very best to start a process. I give you the example of energy. I think that is one of the main substances we need for economic production and for our livelihood. I was eight years headquartered in Nairobi in Kenya, and I learned in those days that poverty is first and foremost always energy poverty. So if you want to come to development, you need energy. And therefore the question, where is the energy coming from, was a very vital question. This country was fully dependent in our time, when I was a minister sitting in the third row here. It's a little bit nostalgic to be here back, as you may imagine. We had only coal and nuclear. And then we had the disaster of Chernobyl, and we were without any alternative. We simply had to prove technically, are they safe, or as safe as we can imagine. But then we started and said, we must come to another situation. We must have an alternative. That's my main topic. Our policy is going more and more in the there is no alternative direction. You know that Maggie Thatcher was mentioned in the cabinet, Tina Thatcher, there is no alternative. And so we developed, invested a lot of money in science, technology for renewable energy. That gave us now the chance after Fukushima to say we can go out of nuclear. Nuclear, as the fossil fuels, are exactly not echoing positively what you mentioned. We have a lot of externalized costs, a lot. You can go through all this, the time is not available for that, but you know. And so we try now to internalize this again with a lot of benefits and a lot of huge challenges, without any doubt. It's a totally other, it is a paradigm shift, what we are doing. And um, that has something to do, of course, with technology, but much more also with values. Our government, the Chancellor, decided in those days before making this decision to um, decide for uh, what she called and what is called, named, an ethic commission for a safe energy supply. An ethic commission. You may imagine it was intensively discussed. What is ethics in the discussion for nuclear or coal? That's technology and that is economics, but ethics? I had the chance to be the chairman of this commission, integrating 17 people from all ways of life, a bishop, a cardinal on the one side, and the CEO of the biggest chemical company in this country, and the head of a trade union, all this, and some scientists, some old politician like me. And we came to the conclusion that it is, of course, a question how to handle values in a society. And there's one sentence, I don't have the paper with me, but it is nearly the 100% saying that the values of a society precede, are more important than the economic consequences. Believe me, in an open democracy as we have it here, it's not easy to make majorities for such a sentence. We have quite soon a situation to prove it. The exact advantage we got that we had the decision for this paradigm shift in energy nearly unanimously adopted in our parliament. It is not a partisan decision, it is a bipartisan decision. That gives stability. So even after the coming election, I see no party now in the election campaign arguing for changing this again. There's a lot of criticism of the way how we handle it, or the government is handling it, it's fine. But what I want to underline is that this was a development over some 20, 25 years. The target for going out of nuclear fully, we closed down nine nuclear power stations immediately. We have some nine still on uh, the grid. We have the target to go out of these nine as well until 2022. So if we are successful in doing this, 
we needed something like 35 years to develop the technology and make it an accepted topic. So I'll give you only one example. You could have a lot of others sure, as well. Sure, That is uh, very interesting. And you raised, uh, I mean, uh, Again, progress at the level of policy. We see that uh, you know, there has been some progress since you were environment minister, which is about 20, 30 years now in the last, uh, the debate is moving forward. But you've raised one really crucial question, which I think indicates a somewhat of a fundamental shift, which is the question of values, which is coming in into debates about uh, uh, in, in the economy, economic models. Now, let me ask you, Jakob von Ukul, now you're the founder of the World Future Council and the Right Livelihood Award. Now. Um, Everybody here, public policy, the corporates, as well as uh, John, have mentioned some progress has been made in the last few decades in this discussion of changing economic values. Is that enough? What would you see as key priorities to ensure that we have a more sustainable and socially responsible uh, world? Problem is that progress has been made, but the problems we face have been growing much faster. First thing to realize that in the Middle Ages, um, the church ruled all aspects of life here. And if you wanted to debate the powers of the church uh, with them, you had to, those debates were only held in Latin. So you had to learn Latin. And today, as you know, finance and economics sort of rule the world. And if you want to debate them and understand them and challenge them, you have to learn financial Latin. And once you've done that, you realize that much of what you're being told uh, it's not just wrong, it's actually, you know, quite, um, uh, quite mad. I mean, the belief, you know, these are prominent Anglo-Saxon economists who our governments listen to. They believe, like Lauren Summers does, that nature is a subsystem of the, of the economy instead of the other way around. They believe that you can uh, eat money, that economic growth will continue even if agriculture collapses because of growing climate change. These, again, are people who won the so-called Nobel Prize in economics who say things like that. So a couple of points, I think, which are important to understand. First of all, the growth debate. Unfortunately, the limits to growth was a snappy title, but it missed one uh, word, I mean, limits to economic growth. And once you realize that that was what was meant, you realize that what will happen is not that growth will suddenly disappear. What will happen and what has happened is that economic growth has become uneconomic growth. In many areas, uh, we have been producing, first of all, we have been producing debts much faster than we're producing wealth over the past 40 years. And we've been producing uneconomic growth, i.e. we are basically building defensive mechanisms, we're protecting ourselves against the consequences of, of growth, we are not really improving quality of life. And if you talk to many people in the middle classes in most countries in the world except China, they'll say, well, you know, I haven't really noticed my life improving over the past um, decades. Second thing is a, a trick of economists, you notice it with climate, so-called skeptics like Bjorn Lomborg, that trick is you discount the future. And once you discount the future, the future in 30, 40 years is worth very, very little. Now, as Pavan Suktev, who went from the Deutsche Bank to UNEP, has said, discounting the future, sort of devaluing it, assumes we're going to be richer in future, if in fact we are not. And, you know, 60% of people in the UK now think that their children are going to have a worse quality of life. Only 10% think it's going to improve. So if you go with that majority view, Pavan Suktev says discount rates really should be negative. That, of course, throws the whole economic system and, uh, again, would have massive implications. Also, the other point is this belief that money is short. Now, money, as we know, is human product. We've been brainwashed into being told if we print money, that will be inflationary. It won't as long as you produce new money against new performance, against production of new goods and services, getting unemployed people and productive resources working, then you have a balance of new money and new products, then it's not inflationary. And the belief that we, there's not enough money to do what needs to be done is again um, nonsense. John Maynard Keynes said, whatever a society can do, you know, what it has the resources to do, it can finance. So I think there are a key, couple of key points there which are absolutely basic to understand and explain to the public you know, what's, what's going on. The other point which we've already touched on is this question of internalizing costs. Everybody wants to internalize costs for markets to work. The problem is, who's going to pay? You know, we are now have to tell people that you are, you're not as rich as you thought. You're, we are facing three huge bills. It was this financial bubble, growth rates on which they base their pensions, which don't exist in the real economy. Then the bills for the past, costs which have to be internalized. And you know what that means? If you just try to get rid of the subsidies on petrol, for example, in Jordan, meant that taxi drivers' income fell by two-thirds. In Nigeria, same thing. They almost had a revolution on their hands. 
So very nice in theory, in practice, an enormous challenge. And in future, of course, we can't live at the expense of nature and future generations anymore. So we're going to have to internalize the full cost of production. What does that mean? Well, Puma is a very lucky company. It's a sustainable company. When they did these calculations, at the end they found they would be much less profitable if they had paid for all the externalized costs, but they would still be profitable. There are very many companies in the world who wouldn't. They would basically wouldn't be not profitable. We're actually subsidizing them. The whole financial system the banking system, according to Andrew Haldane, a high Bank of England official, if it had to pay for the costs of financial crisis, it would basically be extinct, it would be unprofitable. So if people tell you, oh, the market will solve it, well then first create the market. There is no market in energy. If you look at the subsidies for fossil fuels, you realize there is no energy market. And this again is a quote from Pavan Suktev. If you actually take away the costs of Chinese growth, this miraculous Chinese GDP growth over the past 10 years, it disappears. You know, uh, there are so many trillions of dollars which have been externalized that having to internalize them and pay for them, who is going to pay for them, is going to be a huge challenge. And explaining that mm -hmm. to your readers, to your listeners, to your viewers, I think is going to be the greatest challenge you face. The World Future Council works to uh, identify good policies which work and helps to spread those. We work as, you know, build capacity for policy makers, inform them, we advise them, and, uh, you know, we find that is probably a key work which needs to be done now, which needs really? more support and more mm -hmm. publicity. We also do a couple of studies, and I'll just mention one to you, because it's, it's again, unique. Yeah. Uh, the costs, <laughs> the economic... Jakob, if I may just interrupt yeah, you there. Sentence. Yeah, just one, yeah, okay. Please look, take a look. The economic costs of not using renewable energy. All the time you hear about the costs of solar and wind, etc. What about every day we're not using the sun? Because the sunshine of today, we can't harness anymore tomorrow. Instead, we're burning valuable fossil fuels. Trillions of dollars of natural capital wasted don't appear in any of the bottom lines we're always told about. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, that was... <laughs> a lot of interesting points were raised there, and uh, as... Uh, Former Minister Tupfer said, I was shorter because I'd warned them all. You have to keep your opening comments very short. <laughs> Thank you very much. You raised lots of very important questions. And one of them, of course, is working for the future. And the person who's been working for the future and received uh, the Alternative uh, Livelihood Award is uh, Professor Dr. Ibrahim Abulish, who set up SECAM, a, a company based on social entrepreneurial uh, uh, principles. He also uh, has been called a social entrepreneur by the World Economic Forum. Your company, Seekam, has also been described as a sustainability champion. Now tell us, while everyone is trying to change now, your company was founded on the principles of sustainability about 36 years ago. What explains your success? What can we learn from it? Thank you, Amrita. Uh, first of all, if we see now our problem, world problem, we see that there are systemic problem. They are interconnected, interdependent, and we cannot see one without taking the other in consideration. So, uh, 977, also now more than 35 years ago, I established the SECAM initiative in Egypt. Egypt is the poor country with 95% of desert, and try to integrate the four dimensions of life the economy, the ecology, the culture, means education, building, and the human rights. All the four, to balance between all the four. So in the economic dimension, we, uh, we have to reclaim desert, and we have a huge company now that only reclaiming thousands of hectares of desert. And then we use the eco-agriculture, to produce uh, raw products without using any chemicals and uh, pesticides and all that. And then, out of the raw materials, we are producing medicine, natural medicine, food, and organic textiles out of organic cotton. That is in the economic part. And we do well now. We have thousands of people working in the country and in the companies. And out of the profit we establish, even in the same time, we establish the Second Development Foundation, and that cares for education. Now we have many schools, kindergartens, uh, vocational training center, 
uh, where we serve hundreds, thousands of people. And then uh, uh, medical center, we care also for the health of the community, so for 40,000 40, people around the year. And we established uh, research center. Of course, if you want to go ahead for sustainable development, you need innovation, you need to research. So, uh, and we do it, of course, with mutual research with all the partners around the world, especially here in Europe. And uh, newly, we established Heliopolis University for sustainable development. Just to let young people raised, to develop personality of young people, to understand this holistic view of sustainable development, that they themselves can be activists and change the world around them. And uh, on the human uh, rights, we, uh, we engage, of course, the entire uh, stakeholder in, in, in a holistic, uh, transparent, and uh, we endorse of course, all the human rights and uh, all the uh, global compact uh, contacts and all the, and we are also for female, female uh, employees, so for, the, uh, for their rights. Uh, and on the other hand, for the ecology, we care for soil fertility. We care for the plant, for the diversity, biodiversity, for the air. And you said something very interesting. You talk about healing the soil. Yeah. That's a part of your principles. Yes, we've Seekum. got the, the, mm. the, the dyed soil since years. Uh, to enliven it, that means to bring again the, bi the uh, microorganism in the soil, and that is technology, that is science and technology. We, we use it there. I think we have a lot to learn. In fact, I have to tell, uh, Dr. Avilish had a little presentation of 10 minutes about his company, which is called Seekem, S-E-K-E-M. But due to time reasons, we could not show it to you here. But do actually go on his website and have a look about the company, because it's a very fine example of how social entrepreneurial enterprises uh, can be the way for the future. Let me just ask Yana there, Yana. Are they, uh, what, is, what are people saying on Twitter? Do you have any comments as yet? be economic development. Okay, now it's working, so let me start again. <laughs> there are a number of tweets coming in, and there's one referring to the keynote address in the beginning, and it says, does Mr. Schatzschneider believe there can be economic development without human security? Will investors come when bullets are flying? Which might be an interesting point for the panelists. So what role does security play in economic development? And uh, the other tweets basically say, it should be so simple. If corporate social responsibility works and makes sense economically, why don't companies just apply to that? Why don't you just do it? So one is asking, do you think corporate social responsibility should be mandatory or voluntary? Thank you very much, and that's, of course, uh, come to the heart of the issue, what you were saying, John, that corporate social responsibility should not be voluntary, it should be mandatory. Now, a lot of companies, big corporate companies, um, have uh, uh, programs of corporate social responsibility, but there's also a great deal of suspicion, I hear among uh, people who've been talking in these workshops, that this is all a brand-making image, they're just trying to improve their image, that there's nothing serious, they're, they're not changing the actual way they're doing work. What has been your experience in this? Yeah, and I just want to clarify my words. I mean, having mm -hmm. worked in industry myself, mm -hmm. I'm not, I, I don't think that everything, all CSR should be mandatory, not mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. That's not what I said. I, I think it's a smart mix. It's, it's, an, it's as crazy to say that CSR should be mandatory as it is to say that CSR should be voluntary. Both of those are crazy propositions, as far as I'm concerned. There are some aspects of human rights impacts where it makes sense for regulation to come in. And actually, in some instances, uh, companies themselves want that. It creates a level playing field. So good companies that are internalizing social cost and you know that's that's affecting the bottom line they want regulation because their competitors are going to compete against them maintaining the externalization of costs so let's be really targeted about where where mandatory approaches 
are necessary. I think conflict minerals in the supply chain is one example of that. There are quite a few examples. But to say that it has to be a voluntary approach, uh, a priori, yes, I'm very much against that. Yeah. But talking about regulation, Klaus Treffer, do you think the government should be more involved at the international and national level in setting up regulation and policy frameworks which encourage businesses to uh, change their kind of social behavior apart from their economic mm -hmm. profit making? I'm absolutely convinced that that's necessary. You cannot expect, and that was your mention as well, that markets are doing the job by themselves. Markets are not coming like manna from heaven. Markets are a product of mankind. And if you have this, of course, you need regulation. If you don't have regulation to CO2, you don't have a ma market for CO2, and you have no price for it, so you are subsidizing the prices for fossil fuel. I'm absolutely convinced that we need command and control measures. I'm it's not so, for the Germans, not so very um, clear, because uh, also those parties, uh, a little bit linked with this, uh, are not fully convinced that this is the right sentence, but I'm very convinced to do so. For example, we need here in Germany quite now something like a limiting value for the emission of CO2 from coal power station. Otherwise, having the very poor, uh, very cheap coal quite now, they are out um, uh, performing all the other energy and we have an increase in CO2. We were convinced that will be done by the CO2 certificates, but the price of a certificate in Europe is now two or three euros per ton, it's nothing. We expected 25 to 30. So there is no regulation linked with this market of CO2. So please, make it command and control. I'm very convinced that this is necessary. And going to this question, we were always in UNEP, and I know that my friend and successor Achim Stein is going exactly in the same direction, or in a better way, and I did it, but nevertheless the direction is comparable. We developed the Global Reporting Initiative. We did whatever is possible to make this mandatory. And if we have reporting in a world with very active journalists, that is the best way. That may be then not mandatory, but it is in the result like this. So we also try to integrate this in the reporting for, yeah, for the markets. Nobody is questioning that year by year a private company has to deliver on a clear set of informations what is the result in economic terms of this company. And that goes to the stock markets to make all this happen. We want to have the same integrated also in the social and environment procedure. Then you have a feedback in the activity of people and the possibility for lots of people to act informed. You see, that is, many of the countries have introduced these integrated uh, annual reports where they have a social and corporate responsibility component which is made public. There are lots of regulations at the international level, responsible principles for investment, guidelines, the global social compact. Not regulations. Uh, yeah, but, but they, they do, codes. yeah, but they're voluntary codes, but they do set a policy framework within which companies can, uh, can work. But how effective are they? How, who ensures compliance? Who ensures that these companies are following these voluntary principles they claim to follow? It's a very simple and short answer to start with. We have an international organization which exists since 1920, the ILO, the International Labor Organization, and most of its rules are still voluntary. Then we got some years ago the World Trade Organization, which has uh, you know, binding rules. Countries are worried all the time. They're being told you mustn't break you know, WTO rules. So um, if somebody tells you, well, I am, you know, we are socially uh, responsible and or a business association, there's a very simple question. Would you agree that the conventions, the rules of the ILO get the same uh, legal status, the same enforcement status as the rules of the World Trade Organization? That answer to that question will give you everything you want to know about the social responsibility of the company claiming to be so. No, Rana, I mean, we're talking about companies and corporates. I mean, obviously, there are some really negative examples about what corporates have been doing in the past, be it the Gulf of Mexico, oil spill, be it the Bhopal tragedy in India, or, or oil extraction in Nigeria. Now, companies are under pressure not just to be seen to be, uh, not just doing uh, um, their economic activities in a more uh, 
socially responsible way, but also seem to be doing that. Now, how convinced are you? Are motives important? Is it, I mean, what companies are doing transparent enough? Is it good enough what they are doing? Your company also came under pressure before it switched uh, to some of its supply chain uh, activities. Well, basically we are almost every year under pressure, especially when we have a sports event. Um, but coming back to this, um, when we started with our we don't call it anymore CSR, but I think this time is over, we say CR, it's corporate responsibility, it's more than social, more than environmental, basically going beyond. Anyway, when we started with this, we put our suppliers worldwide under pressure, saying you have to do this. Well, of course, when we went then to the factories and checked them, announced, unannounced, whatever, we found out, well, they are back to sheeting, just to please us in order to get orders. Mm -hmm. Compliance was equivalent, to, um, to, to the amount of order. Well, then we found out, well, this is certainly not the way it should be. I wonder, how difficult is it for you? 90% of your production is in Asia? More than 90%. More than 90%. Mm -hmm. Now, you've got factories in countries like China, Vietnam. Now, you would like them to conduct uh, uh, the practices in these factories in a more sustainable and, uh, way. How difficult is it for you to influence developments within these factories in these countries? Well, as I was saying, um, we had a time where compliance or sustainability was equivalent to the amount of orders. Um, we had this discussion already this morning uh, that we have to have a, a paradigm shift. Um, we experienced this slowly, especially the younger management within the factory. As soon as they see there's a win-win situation in terms of sustainability, that they do something and have a return on investment, either on the social or on the environmental side, uh, they do it. Uh, coming back to the reporting, GRI, I mean, we from Puma, we have started as well. We don't call it an integrated report, although both is in, financial and non-financials, but as I was saying, to make it really complete, the entire social part of the equation is still missing. Um, but we asked our suppliers here as well, we forced them in the very beginning, a friendly force, now they're doing this voluntary reporting. Mm -hmm. And this is a fantastic tool to identify their gaps because they really have to be honest, because this is then being later published, everybody can read this. So all our strategic suppliers now worldwide came up with a first GRI approved report and were able to say, ooh, here are gaps, here are loopholes we have to fill, we have to do better. And now this is voluntary, they do this frequently. So this, this certainly helps, um, although um, we're doing this for quite a while now, we're still not ready, still not ready. Right, so the important thing to remember is that you're making changes not just, say, at your head office uh, here in Germany or in Europe, but also in the supply traders who are actually supplying your uh, company. Talking about a win-win situation, I've been advised that all of you hold your microphones a bit closer to your mouth, so it'll be uh, audible at the back. Uh, talking about a win-win situation, your company is a perfect example of a win-win situation. You've also talked about something which I found fascinating, the economics of love. Where does that fit in? That is the supply chain. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us more. Yeah. So uh, every element in the supply chain, the, we made it transparent so that everyone knows the price, the justice price by the consumer. So and we calculated back to the farmers. So the, the poor farmers are now much richer than before and everyone knows the, how the price, the right price, is regardless of the market price. So that is what the people call the, uh, the economic economy of love. love. But we also issue a sustainable development report every year. We have targets we have to achieve on the four dimensions, in culture, in economics, and in human rights and, uh, of course, in the ecological. And, so, and you can see it, we publish it, it is in, the, in our website, uh, to improve the, our performance every, every year. Now, talking about uh, improving performance, uh, as we've all agreed that we are moving in the right direction. People are talking about values, integrity, ethics, and economics, which when I was younger, I mean, was unthinkable. Economics was, you know, business was about making profit. Your loyalty was to a shareholder. That's no longer the case, but we're still not making progress fast enough, John. 
Yeah, we need some radical shifts. Um, I don't think regulation's enough. I mean, people who say, once we get this regulated at the international level, well, dream on, okay? I mean, the ILO's a great example. It is about enforcement at the end of the day. Um, let's not, I mean, let's get the World Trade Organization to bring in social values. That would be a, 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 a first step. But actually, some of the things that are going to shift us further, I think, than even regulation are radical transparency. So I completely agree with, with the words on reporting. Radical transparency in terms of impact of companies. And then market-based mechanisms. I mean, the work that Al Gore is doing at the moment on stranded assets and climate change. Um, governments could stop quarterly reporting. There's a lot that governments could do when regulating markets that shifts us away from the short-termism that pervades the business community at the moment. So those kind of measures, I think, are actually more, even more fundamental than, 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 than regulating what a company should do in a small way. Um, I think we need a, a mixture of quite big things. Really. Quite big things. And quite, uh, you talked about, uh, uh, Klaus, for about... Uh, the media playing a quite an important role. We, what about the civil society? Does the pressure need to come from civil society as well, that we need to radically rethink the way we discuss economic growth? There have been a lot of discussion during this Global Media Forum about uh, GDP being a very narrow indicator of economic well-being, that we need to broaden this concept. Do, does civil society need to put more pressure on policymakers, on corporates to change their habits? Absolutely clear, yes. Mm. You see, in a democratic society, you must be re-elected. And so you will see that what the people want to have is quite an important uh, um, stimulus for what is the political agenda. Again, an example. What we learn that people in this country are more and more intensively interested to decentralized decision and topics. They want to have their hands on it. Going once more to this new paradigm shift in energy. In those days we have now 700 new energy cooperatives. People come together, they do it themselves. Decentralized is one of the main topics. Believe me, now in the city of Berlin they have a public uh, activity to bring the grid back to the local authorities. All this is a movement. This plays, of course, a huge role now for all the politicians. And they want to add their interest, their voice, and their perspective for this as well. So yes, politicians are always reacting to what is the main drive in the society. Puma didn't start it against the consumer. They were very well aware that to have such an image gives you a premium in the market. And I'm fairly convinced that's a good idea. If more and more people are convinced that this gives you a premium in the market from the consumer, that they are not only asking what is the best price, knowing that this is a limited indicator as the GDP is a limited indicator. We had in this country, in this uh, legislation period, the first enquete commission on growth. Do we have alternatives? You know the Stieglitz uh, um, and um, uh, Fitoussi work uh, in, in France. The question, what do we have to change? I believe that comes again from bottom up. Mm. Lots of people are very concerned that what they are doing is not the full price to pay for their well-being. They have the feeling and they are asking it. That we tried here last and <laughs> you know, she mentioned in the beginning, I should be very brief because that is the main problem of former politicians that they are never stopped speaking. No, 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 so not therefore I mentioned it to you that's <laughs> only to make it a little bit more lively. Why? So I once more I'm very, very convinced that this is a movement in the broader public and the journalists are playing a huge role in this field. And, you know, being a sitting minister, you was always convinced, ah, that is over-criticized and that is not correct, you was not happy. But they made us the seat very hot. Yeah. So we were jumping. And this was necessary unto the polls. If environment in those days in the polls, what are the most important topics in, in German politics? 
Environment was in those days always number one or number two. That gave me a better rank in the cabinet, in the society, than to sit only in the third row there. Yeah? It's a little bit to give you a feeling that this is not theoretically. That's the day-to-day -day job you are confronted with, either in the private business, where we have to run up to the expectation of the consumers and influence them as well, and the politics as well. Thank you very much. Now, I just want to ask you one more question, uh, Jakob von Oechselwald. How important is it to have role models who are aspiring to these kind of policies? Now, you have the Right Livelihood Award. How important is that in influencing? Because we're always celebrating, you know, sports personalities and rich entrepreneurs and you know, um, film stars and all, but you offer something quite different. Well, role models are extremely important, and I'm extremely happy that one of the recipients of the Right Love of the Award is right here with us. With us. Uh, I've, I've thought that these role models would somehow spread, you know, and become the new mainstream, as I put it. And I realized some years ago that that wasn't happening, certainly not happening fast enough. And that's why I realized that, you know, these sort of best practice role models need to be backed up by best policies. And I was in Parliament one period, and I realizing from my colleagues that, that policymakers are often sort of lost. They don't have the capacity. They, don't, they are not aware of what's going on in other countries. And so that's why I set up the World Future Council, which basically works, you know, speaks up for the interest of future generations who are not represented anymore, although in our past generations had such institutions. Councils will see us into the future. Today we impact future generations more than ever. They don't have a voice. So this is one idea, but not just a voice, but also seeing what are future-proof policies. Where are there good laws, regulations, etc.? Which where are the existing laws which could be expanded? You know, laws against unfair competition. Well, surely externalizing costs is also unfair competition. So that's why also a number of the the recipients of the Right Lauded Award, like uh, Dr. Abelish, are also members of the the World Future Council, and we work with parliamentarians in all of the world. And I think the most important message, I think, is make sure that you don't make politics sound dirty. Expose, you know, dirty politicians, but also report on the good work, the important work which is being done there. Remember that in ancient Greece, you know, if you were involved in politics, you were known as a politus. People who refused to get involved in politics were known as an idiotus. It's very important <laughs> to engage politically and to honor those who do hard work doing that. And I know as Thomas Friedman, your US colleague, once said, the more, important it's, um, the, the more boring it is, the more important it is. But your job is to make the important not boring, but exciting. Thank you. Yeah, and I'd also make a plea that uh, what's a report when uh, corporate companies are doing good work? I mean, I think there's been a fair bit of hostility towards uh, certain corporate practices during our, a global media forum, but I think somebody raised the point that we also need to recognize that business is doing good. They have a reputation which is uh, somewhat uh, tarnished, but some of them are doing good business, and we as the media should also be reporting at that. Now I want to actually ask our uh, audience if they have any questions, and while you're thinking, I'm quickly going to ask Jana if she has any tweets, and then think quickly and we'll be uh, taking questions from the floor. Yes, Jana. I have uh, a question for Professor Töpfer, just came in, and um, talking about resolutions, uh, solutions, he, she said, uh, should we just hand out fewer CO2 emission certificates? What do you think, would that help? And the other one is, um, what about, we have the example of Puma, but what about uh, companies who produce low, in a lower price segments? Let's think about Bangladesh and Kik or whatever companies. Can they afford sustainability? Right. Uh, we'll uh, keep those two questions in mind. And uh, let me just ask, uh, we have uh, people who are carrying microphones. You also have mics in front of you. You can switch them on. So I want to take two or three questions and then we'll get the panelists to answer them. I'd request you to identify yourself when you get up and the company or uh, organization you're linked to, if you wish. And then if you have a question directed at a panelist to mention them. And I would urge you, if you can, to try and keep your comments a bit short. Thank you. So, put up your hands. Who wants to ask a question? There's a gentleman right at the back in uh, what looks like a pale uh, mauve shirt. Hello. This is uh, Andreas Becker from Deutsche Welle. I just have a quick question to Mr. Hengsmann from Puma. You said, we did the math and we came up with a huge amount of money we would have to pay to nature if nature had a bank account. Now, nature, this concerns like 2010 when you started doing the math, but nature still doesn't have a bank account, so what do you do with the money? 
Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay, think about the questions and let's start. And, uh, oh, sorry, I didn't have a look. And the lady in the black jacket here. Yeah. Thank you very much. My name is Susanne Weber. I come from Marburg University, and I'm very much interested in the topic of the role of universities for a great transformation. So I would like to ask uh, for comments on the role of uh, universities and as well for global network building of universities for change. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, maybe we just have a few answers now before uh, Cluster Fuller. We'll wait for that. We'll come back to you in the second round. Uh, Cluster do you want to answer this question about um, we had from on the tw uh, Twitter account, and that was about mm, yeah. energy? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I mentioned in my previous remarks that uh, we expected that the certificates for CO2 will have a high price. They don't have a high price, they have a very low one. The reason for this is that we have much too much of those certificates. We have, if we have a lot in the market, the price is low, and therefore there is one active movement to reduce the number of the certificates so that the price goes up. Unluckily, the European Parliament decided not to go in this direction. It has a lot of consequences, for example, in the European Union, let me give you one example for Poland and for others, because they have a lot of those certificates and they want to have a use later in their economy also to sell it for a better price in the market. So yes, it would be helpful. I'm not as uh, nah, yeah, blue-eyed to believe that this will happen. And therefore, I repeat once more, we cannot sit back and wait the time to come. We have to use other instruments as well. And uh, therefore, to go in this direction is a very good one. I would love it if we can increase the price for CO2, making coal less competitive. But for the time being, I don't see it. And therefore, I believe it would be necessary to combine command and control instruments with market instruments if they are at all really usable. Thank you. And John, may I ask you to respond to that question about uh, sustainability for small companies? Big companies like Puma and have deep pockets. Can small companies afford to be sustainable? This is where regulation comes in. This is why we need laws, because big companies can adapt. If you don't have laws, then you're privileging large companies. This is what, it never gets put that way when, when people lobby against regulation. They don't understand that they're actually not... Um, defending the rights and interests of small and medium-sized enterprises. Health and safety, for example, non-discrimination, these issues are regulated. It doesn't matter if you have five employees or 5,000. Um, this is needed. Um, and, and, and so if you are you know, a supplier in Bangladesh or you are, you, you're buying goods at a very small margin, the only way that we can affect the change we need is to mandate the internalization of social costs in particular high-risk areas. I, I firmly believe that. Mm -hmm. um, small growth, market-based solutions won't be enough um, in, in, in high-risk contexts, whether that's Central Africa or whether it's Bangladesh or wherever it is. Yeah. But what about you, uh, Puma? You wanted to, uh, there was a question on uh, uh, Puma. Yeah, where's the nature doesn't have a bank account, so where's your money going? <coughs> Okay, uh, what I was saying, we can only manage if we measure. So the thing is, uh, we have just started this year, just a few months ago, basically, a huge project together with the German DEG and KFW, where we address at, at least 50 of our biggest suppliers, or 50 of our suppliers, which have 90% of the business in Asia, and, uh, and we are addressing sustainability there, and especially uh, based on our scorecard, that's, uh, that's, why, um, that's how we named it, uh, addressing the, the reduction of major environmental KPIs such as carbon dioxide, such, such as water, as waste. So they will get, uh, over the period of three years, very intense support consulting on-site training uh, to reduce this. Beside this, as I was saying, we come up as well again with the next EPNL within this year, probably at the end, to see where we are standing. Because um, I mentioned this morning, um, this was the first trial, so of course we had to do some adjustment. We had uh, as well some expert, um, external expert commenting on this, so everything has not been included in the next EPNL which is coming out. 
but we are still now focusing on the supply chain to get things adjusted. We now come to the question uh, from the lady from Marburg University, and I have asked Dr. Ovali, uh, company has set up a university to train young people the role but of... Before, uh, before the topic of university, yeah. I want also to talk to the CO2 emission reduction certificates. Uh, I know that the CO2 production will cost more than 60, 60 euro per ton, and we sell it for six. So that's why we have to do something for the small companies, and also for people who aim to work in sustainable development. As we done the human development uh, Millennium uh, Human Development Goals, we have to do something for the Sustainable Development Goals. We have to subsidize, uh, so not we, but uh, funds from, from governments have to subsidize that, and the media has also a huge role. This consumer pattern, just to buy the cheapest, that had to be changed. And to universities, our universities are still subscribing to a very old world view. We have to have a look for the future, to have an idea for the future, and to prepare new curriculum and to help develop people, also students, to carry on for, uh, for the future. And so sustainable development universities like ours, where we have engineering, we teach renewable energy, graduates, water engineering, and we have pharmacies where we also have natural pharmacies so that they can uh, use renewable resources. And the same, and that is the most dangerous one, is business and economics. You know how ethics play a human, a so very important role in, in business and economics. And to the ethics, I would say, ethics emerged from thinking, from building. If people <clears throat> still learn how to uh, analyze analytical thinking, if people still learn the linear thinking, nothing will change in business. Because we lived now more than 12 billion years, the, uh, the ecological way here, and all of this was in a circular way. There is no waste in their nature. And this type of thinking, oh, it's not only thinking, that is what the German call Bildung, that is much more than education and thinking, that is also feeling and will. And that had to be changed. Universities had to have another uh, aims now, another, uh, for, even for the future. Thank you. That's very good. Over here. Now, I have a question for all of you. We have five minutes left of our session, and obviously many of you want to uh, uh, ask questions. Uh, would you be fine if we took five minutes of your coffee break and continued and asked questions and got some answers? Raise your hands for those who are in favor of taking five minutes of your coffee break. Brilliant. That's a tribute to all of you here, the panelists. So now I can uh, relax. <laughs> and uh, um, um, Jacob, you wanted to uh, respond to one of the questions, and then we'll have a second round of uh, questions here. Well, just um, to say there is, uh, in the next few days, in Zermatt in Switzerland, the Zermatt Summit, which was set up by a Swiss businessman, Christopher Wassermann, as an antidote to Davos thinking. Um, I was there last year. We have now, here in Bonn, our annual meeting of the World Future Council, so I can't go there. But if some of you are interested in this kind of theme, I think you will find it uh, a highly, highly interesting. So there are these, these meetings, there are these discussions going on. Uh, to get away from the fact that much of what is taught in universities and economics and finance is, is really, you know, ideological nonsense. The problem is if you start talking differently, and we had this at the last Zermatt Summit, one of the <coughs> women who runs a business school in Lausanne said, but my students say, but you're not educating us for the real world. What about, you know, when we go out there? 
And so we said, well, you know, we have to start somewhere. And so the, the World Future Council has drafted a global policy action plan, which about, you know, the 20 policies we felt were the key policies changes we need to change course. And one of them is an ecologi a mandatory ecological literacy test for candidates for public office, uh, graduates of business school and for economists. And interesting enough, that was the one which got the most media interest when we first came out with it. So I think that is you know, where we need to start. Yes, we need to reform the education universities. First of all, we need to introduce ecological literacy because much of mm -hmm. what's being taught now you know, worldwide is just nonsense. I mean, there is no way, for example, that the resource per capita use we have here will ever be possible in, in China. And the Chinese are aware of that, but we don't seem to be aware of that. The challenges which right. that uh, bring are obviously enormous, and we need to bring those into the university education too. Thank you. And now, uh, questions again. So raise your hands. Uh, the lady in a, a black jacket there, and then uh, the gentleman at the back uh, with glasses. Yeah, the next two. Please start. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Barbara. I'm from Uganda. Uh, I appreciate the organizers for allowing us to look at the Chad case study yesterday. And we had the story of Chad, where 10 years of oil extraction are 10 years of tears. As we discuss this topic today, the multinational companies who are the culprits are, at, are free to do what they do. And they continue to do that in all the developing world. Can we pronounce ourselves? What should be done to these multinational companies? Because I feel it would be lip service if we left this panel without a pronunciation on that. Thank you. The gentleman uh, with glasses. Um. Me? Yes. OK. Thanks very much. Talking about uh, ecological literacy. Now, when we talk about the green economy, what we have in mind is the a clean environment. We talk about addressing climate change, addressing issues related to desertification, and above all, also water. Wouldn't it be more appropriate to speak of a blue economy because all these three issues, among others, they have a, they're a part of the global public goods. Thank you. Uh, the lady uh, in green there, please. Heide Schütz from Bonn Women's Network for Peace. Um, it was agreed that if you want peace, it starts in the minds of the people. And I think what has come out here also tells me the same thing. If we want to change in economy as well as in policy, we must change people's minds. Fortunately, we have a, enough people who are really role makers, not only the men who are sitting here, but also many more, including women. And uh, we just listened to the aspect, what is the role of universities? I think schools come in here very, very important. And um, it's so difficult. I was a teacher, you know, to even um, get the confirm of the colleagues and the headmasters in order to change this. It's a long process, but we need more time, acceleration. So there I see the, the conflict. Maybe some of you have a solution. Thank you. The gentleman at the back. Um, Hamid Mazarek from DW Academy, IMS program. Um, my question is not my opinion, but I think it's still important to ask. Um, I, after the accidents in Bangladesh, when the building broke down, I had a, a chance to talk to a woman who worked close to one of those companies. And um, my question is, or I quote her, she said, I asked her what, should, what could people change and so on. And her quote was, please don't change anything because we are worried to lose our existence. We are worried to lose what we have here because without these companies, we couldn't even survive. So I, I think what we talked about before to change the economic values are really important issues. And um, I think also it's important to bring sustainable 
uh, ways of, uh, the, of the economy to local people that they can become more sustainable and for, uh, have a better life for future. But how can we bring laws for international companies and not make the production more more expensive so s that they don't see the point anymore to produce in the foreign countries and they say, okay, then we can produce in Germany or wherever. Right, thank you very much. Uh, there's a gentleman standing at the mic there, yeah. Okay, uh, I wanted uh, uh, all the panelists to answer my question, which is, uh, what is the middle way of a CO2 certificate which everybody is talking about? Uh, if we go back, uh, uh, the developing countries have started just the development program. So they are not the culprits who are actually, who did a lot of uh, CO2 emission in, in the past. It's the West which produced uh, lots of, uh, uh, lots, lots of uh, pollution. What we see is uh, the response uh, was done by the West, uh, and now we are talking about a CO2 certificate when the developing countries are actually trying to catch up the developed. So there has to be a middle way. And why are these bigger companies coming to the, to the developing countries? Because they exploit uh, the rules and regulations over there, because these companies contaminate uh, other countries with less regulations, because they're in that developing countries, the regulations are lesser, so these bigger companies are moving to the developing countries so that they, they can exploit the laws and they can still survive over there, make, make products, and still continue to uh, pollute the environment. Right. Thank you very much for that intervention. And one final comment, and then um, there was a lady here, no? No. You had a question, didn't you? Yes. Uh, one final question, and then uh, we uh, have some. Um, I'm Patricia from Fairtrade International. So do you think that third-party certifications such as Fairtrade, UTS, um, uh, Forest Service Council, Rainforest Alliance, do you think that they can play a bigger role in getting CSR sourcing or sustainable sourcing out of a niche and to become mainstream, if you like? That because right now it's more like uh, yeah we're sourcing 10% of our products uh, from such and such certificate and they, they call it CSR, the company. So do you think what what do you think these third-party certifications or standard-setting uh, organizations can do to to be to drive a bigger change or a, a, a more impactful uh, change? Thanks. Well, thank you very much. Now, as you've seen, that um, our time is again almost up. So what I'm going to suggest is it's very, your interventions were really important. I think it's very important for the panelists to hear what the people are thinking. Obviously, you can't get answers to everything now in uh, uh, the final few minutes that we have. I would suggest that you look at the websites of all these gentlemen. They have done fabulous work and done really interesting uh, analyses. Have a look at them. I'm going to end this session by asking each of the panelists to give you a final comment uh, and either to respond to what somebody has said or just to give a final wrap-up takeaway comment for all of you, starting with you. Thank you very much, because I really have to run to catch a flight. Yeah. <laughs> um, one thing is, uh, maybe it will give some answers. <clears throat> um, I was thinking here as well, the last three days, we haven't reflected on the consumer. Mm. The thing is, uh, just recently Puma had an international stakeholder dialogue and we were reflecting on how to get the message across sustainability to consumer. And what we found out, the consumer is sort of sort of uh, tired of those advertisements and on TV, which are not open, honest, and transparent. So the thing is, uh, and to the, to the question in terms of Bangladesh, well, as long, and if you just walk you through the streets of Bonn or whatever city is, the consumers are after the sales, 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 to get it as cheap as possible, you know, not really willing to pay the, the cost of a product, which are not even reflecting the true costs of a, you know, of a, of a product, I mean, we have, to, we have to get, or we have to come back to capacity building, to education. I see here the big role of the media to get this message across, but in the right manner. I Thank don't know you. how, but... Thank you. Um, Jakob, you want to uh, just make your final comment, and I'll urge you, all of you, to keep it brief uh, since we are into the coffee break now. I think it's, it's clear, you, yes, you need education. You know. The consumer ultimately doesn't rule. As Chandra Nair, who in consumptionomics who advises the Chinese government, wrote in a paper, interesting enough, published in Abu Dhabi, he said, there is no human right to own a car. 
I said to him, what happened when you said that in the USA? He said, they called me an environmental Taliban. <laughs> you know, China's CO2 emissions alone, irrespective of what the rest of the world does and has done, will make the country uninhabitable if it continues on the present route. And the Chinese government knows this. So it's not this kind of conflict, oh, well, you know, what can we do about it? You know, people all want that. People may want impossible things. And it's, you know, due to the media to explain what is, what is possible or not. And the other point is to make people realize that they have much more power than they often think they have. We saw in Germany when communism collapsed, suddenly so-called normal people sat around round tables in East and Germany and had to steer the country. And I think it's very important that people are educated so that they can take responsibility when the time comes. And quite often that means understanding how the system works, how the political system works, understanding what policy solutions there are. Lots of misinformation is being, being spread by those in power at the moment. And uh, you know, I think that needs to be challenged. And then we'll find that many of these artificial conflicts which are presented, especially between environment and development, do not really exist when you actually talk to people in their real lives. Nobody wants to be rich in a polluted and destroyed um, environment. Thank you. Klaustoff. I only want to echo as well, so all the other questions were extremely important, but uh, due to the time. You see, you are right, we cannot go to the developing country and say don't do the mistakes we did in the past. I always quote Indira Gandhi in her famous speech in uh, Stockholm 1972 when she mentioned, not word by word, uh, it is easy to understand that the developed country are recommending to the developing countries that they shouldn't do the same mistakes they did to the developed countries in their development. But she wants to remind us that those mistakes were the reason for our wealth now. So we cannot simply go, you have not to do it. That is my answer that we have, for example, the obligation to develop those energy technologies which must be competitive even in the subsidized, ecologically and socially subsidized traditional energies in the same level of prices that they can be used for the development agenda in those countries. So when we invested in uh, solar, let me say it, in this country, we have in this country in the average per year 900 solar hours. Stupid to start here with solar. If you go to Africa, if you go to the Arabic Peninsula, you have 3,500 new solar hours. But we have to do it here because we have to develop the technology in a way that this is then also usable on economic terms in those countries. And that is very difficult to explain it to our citizens here. That is not, we have to do the job, we have to do it together. I'm happy that the new institution of the United Nations for Renewable Energy is at headquartered in Abu Dhabi, IRENA. All this gives you the signal, we cannot simply say what is not possible, what we did in the past, but we have to prove that other technologies are also possible for a well-off society as we are here in this country, even if in the beginning it is much more expensive. By the way, all the other energy technologies we used were very expensive in the very beginning, were heavily subsidized by public um, uh, money, by taxpayers' money, and they are until today heavily subsidized, and therefore that is my answer. And we don't have certificates, prices in developing countries. We have them here, in Europe. We have starting a little bit in China as well, only to mention this. Again, this seems to me to be the need for cooperation and solidarity. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, we need to keep our final comments really short because everyone's kind of now heading for coffee. <laughs> okay, why don't you start, Professor Amanish? Yeah. This is the final thought for people to take away with them. And I began 35 years ago uh, the idea of sustainable development. Everybody considered me as crazy. It will not work. How do you want to finance it? And I give you now the answer. The network. We start producing medicine, natural medicine, out of the raw materials we had and we sell it in Europe and in the States. Without networking with people who understand the vision of sustainable development, we cannot make a progress. Of course, people who don't have the vision, they need subsidy, they need ideas. Thank you.
They were good questions, and it's a shame not to be able to answer them. But three very quick statements. The first is on Bangladesh. Uh, yes, um, we're, we're researching this at the moment. Bangladeshi women want the jobs for many reasons. Um, it seems to be, of course, if there'd been a stronger trade union in the factory, the women might not have gone back in, right? So there, there, is, a, there is something there about empowerment. Um, China labor laws dramatically improved over the past 10 years. A lot of problems still in China, but there is national regulation has worked in China on many labor issues, not everyone. Um, third party assur assurance, yes, the social auditing industry should be thinking long and hard about its existence and the value it adds. I, th I think it re there really is a, a question there moving forward. And the very last comment on Africa, the people of Africa should be able to determine which multinational companies, if any, come into their countries and to do that the much the greater transparency on how licenses are awarded to which companies and journalists should play a key role there and, and you see that a bit in Liberia um, and Ghana um, um, and Botswana but you don't see it in many African countries. Thank you. Thank you very much. If I may just add one final comment from my side. Mahatma Gandhi once said there's enough for the need of everybody in the world but not enough for the greed. And I think that's why we need to keep in mind that it is really fundamental and crucial what these gentlemen have been saying, the need to change economic values. All of us have a role to play. I thank all my panelists here very much for your contributions. I thank all of you for your patience. The session's coordinator is Miriam Bach. If she's there, you can raise your hand. Thank you, Jana. And thanks to the organizers and Connie. Enjoy your coffee and great to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.